The Bucktail in Florida Act 2, 136 years later My outing is over. The canoes hang idly in their slings, and my beautiful summer is past. I have a sad, October-like presentment that it may be my last. These were the gloomy words of George Washington Sears, worrying in the fall of 1884 that he might not see another summer. Sears, under the pen name Nesmuk, had just published the book Woodcraft, a book he surely didn't expect would remain continuously in print for at least the next 135 years. He was also a very popular writer for Forest and Stream, the most widely read outdoors-oriented periodical of the day. But despite his growing popularity, Nesmuk himself, a small man at 5 foot 3 inches tall and 103 pounds, was suffering from tuberculosis and asthma. He looked to the outdoors and to quiet solo adventures to restore his health and vitality, and he did just that through the past summer. I said last March that for one season, I would devote my energies as a woods loafer to home woods, waters, and mountains. And I've pretty well done it. He recounts paddling through northern Pennsylvania, right up until a drought dried up the river to such an extent that it was better wheelbarrowing than canoeing. Passing July on New York's Fulton chain of lakes, not lamenting at all for cityscapes, Nesmuk said of his near eggshell Russian canoe, I've paddled the Sari Gamp on the first four lakes until my arms are lame. Sitting in her this afternoon, I took in six fine trout. She yields to the rush of a 13-inch speckle like a split of bamboo. For a ten and a half pound canoe, she is a marvel of steadiness. I ride in her in pretty rough water without a wiggle. I shall try no lighter one, however. She makes a good sideshow wherever she appears, but a larger canoe would be more comfortable, say 18 pounds. The canoe was Nesmuk's means of escape. He didn't cry for the urban sprawl he left behind, but rather said, I shall be glad to miss the blistering, seething city. And then he went on in verse. For brick and mortar breed filth and crime, and a pulse of evil that robs and beats. And men are withered before their prime, by the curse paved in with lanes and streets. And lungs are poisoned, and shoulders bowed, in the smothering wreck of mill and mine, and death stalks in on the struggling crowd, but he shuns the shadow of oak and pine. As much as he loved his northern woods, at the end of the season and each of the last few years, Nesmuk became nostalgic for warmer days and wilder places, depressed at the onset of the northern autumn and fretting the onset of each new winter. During one trip by rail back to his Pennsylvania home, he stared out the train windows, lamenting the many ways man profits from nature at her expense. The coming of winter and the incessant encroachment of man left Nesmuk with a bleak outlook. And so it was that during the winter of 1884 into 1885, he somehow lifted his spirits and planned a completely different kind of adventure. Looking forward to brighter days, he wrote, It was December last that I received a letter from Captain S.D. Kendall, in which he said, Hello, Nesmuk. What's got you? Are you coming? The thermometer was then marking 20 degrees below zero at my northern home. I was sick in body and spirit, and it was impressed on my mind that the raw, slushy months of February and March were destined to wind up my cruising unless I could reach a more genial climb. And I said, yes, I am coming. I cannot say when or how, but sometime, somehow, I will get there. Pick me out a high, dry camping ground, well shaded by live oaks. Captain Samuel D. Kendall, Nesmick's correspondent and future host, 
was another avid outdoorsman and writer of the day, well known to the readers of Forest and Stream. He was a man who literally paddled his way to Florida, and then couldn't bring himself to leave. In 1881, Kendall and Dr. Charles A. Needy, another avid canoe adventurer and an officer of the American Canoe Association, paddled together from Lake George, New York to Pensacola, Florida on the Gulf of Mexico. But in a note to Forest and Stream, Kendall pointed out the full extent of his journey. My cruise did not commence at Lake George, and it did not end at Pensacola. I put my canoe in the water at Wells River, New Hampshire, cruised to Lake George by way of the Connecticut River, Long Island Sound, Hudson River, Champlain Canal, and rail from Fort Edward. I, after being joined by Dr. Needy, continued on my cruise via canals and rivers to the Gulf. Dr. Needy cruised with me as far as Pensacola, where we separated, he returning north, and I continued my cruise, going as far south as Clearwater Harbor, which would add some 500 miles after Dr. Needy left me. At the time Kendall landed on the west coast of central Florida, much of the landscape was subtropical jungle. It was a wild and unforgiving place, just the thing to set imaginations adrift in adventurous canoeists. Kendall chose to stay, settling along the northern bank of the Anclody River, just west of the future village of Tarpon Springs. Under the pen name Tarpon, Kendall wrote in the September 20. 1883 issue of Forest and Stream. The canoe-loving readers of your paper cannot find a prettier spot for a week or a month's cruise than the west coast of Florida, anywhere between the Cedar Keys and Punta Rasa. It has all the great requisites for that most healthful of all sports. Open waters, bays, creeks, and lagoons, freshwater lakes and streams, fish, oysters, and game in abundance, and good camping grounds almost anywhere. Nesmuk, winter-weary and ill of health, took the bait, gathered his own fishing and hunting gear and a favorite canoe, and planned to head south. His next outing was celebrated even as it began. Clearly Nesmuk was held in high regard as an outdoorsman, because on the January 22, 1885, the unjaded editors wrote on the front page of Forest and Stream, top of the center column, Nesmuk found his way into Forest and Stream last week. He was on his way to Florida and accepted the shelter of a tin roof during a rainstorm in the city and pending the arrival of his bucktail canoe. Putting into practice the preachings of woodcraft, he was going light. The ditty bag and four jackknives completed the equipment. The hatchet had been stowed in his sea chest, somewhat unfortunately too, for lost on the devious ways and intricacies of the stairways and hall passages by which this office is reached, the old woodsman's instinct was strong to blaze a trail. The muzzle loader too was stored in his chest, but we had the pleasure of inspecting the powder horn, the loading tools, and other duffel of the ditty bag. Nesmuk is brimful of mother wit and wisdom. His story magazine is set with a hair trigger and never a misfire. The editors in Nesmuk traded stories long past midnight, and despite Nesmuk's age, 64 years at the time, and his reported frailty, the editors declared, The portrait in Woodcraft is a libel. Wrinkles there shown are not to be discovered in Nesmuk's countenance and may they not be put there by his Florida cruisings. Nesmuk's canoe of choice for his Florida adventure was the Bucktail, ten and a half feet of lapstrake cedar, designed and built by J. Henry Rushton in his Canton, New York workshop. With a beam of 26 inches and a depth of ten and a half inches, the little canoe could handle 300 pounds on a six inch draft. Priced around $30, the bucktail was delivered with a double paddle and a drop-in folding seat. Nesmuk was truly enamored by a beautiful canoe. During one northern excursion as he lay in camp, Nesmuk gazed at his little canoe moored loosely in the water and remarked poetically, The bucktail swings airily to her moorings, even as a thing of life. 
never quite still, no matter how quiet the water, resting on the glassy surface like an eggshell, and always in graceful motion, but so gently, so softly, that at times she seems motionless. I make it a point to moor a canoe where I can lie idolently on a bed of brows, smoke, and watch the graceful motion of the little craft, as by imperceptible degrees she takes in every point of the compass. And while engaged in this laudable occupation, it happens that I forget all about it. The pipe tumbles onto the blanket, and I unconsciously drop off into a sweet, healthy, unpremeditated sleep. And so, Nesmuk headed south. In his first installment of what would become an eight-part series of stories in Forest and Stream, Nesmuk described his decision this way. One year ago, while suffering severe trouble with respiratory organs, I said that another winter must find me south of the snow belt, or I might as well throw up the sponge. I hated to do that. The world, even the northern world, seemed so bright and green in the summertime. Bright lakes, ponds, and rivers to cruise, such sweet cold springs and lovely camping grounds to take in. I felt like asking the Grim Rider to go a little slow on the track for a few years, and I turned my thoughts to Southern California and the Gulf thereof. With his health somewhat restored by his canoe cruises of the summer, and early autumn of 1884, Nesmuk still worried about the upcoming winter, noting that far too many people meet sickness and death from January through May in this northeastern United States. But the Gulf of California? Nesmuk worried, The bucktail turns her beautiful nose up, more in fear than in anger, at the broad waters and crested waves. Her skipper is unwilling to swamp her in rough water, miles from land. And the wind offshore, how could she make the beach? It was about this time that Captain Kendall wrote and invited Nesmuk to join him on Florida's west coast. Nesmuk knew and had a great respect for his fellow outdoorsman, pen named Tarpin, and so he wrote back at once to enthusiastically accept the invitation. But then a cold snap, the thermometer at 22 below zero, and, as Nesmuk described, delay succeeded delay. But finally, after a visit with his admirers at Forest and Stream and their New York City offices, Nesmuk and his bucktail boarded the steamship Tallahassee and departed for Florida at 10 minutes before midnight on the 15th of January, 1885. Two nights later, the ship found itself in a tremendous gale as it rounded Cape Hatteras, a gale that lasted nearly to Savannah. Resting off the ugliness of the last two days, Nesmuk woke in the port of Savannah to find that his little lap streak canoe had been unloaded and was gone, despite he and it being booked for further passage to Fernandina, Florida. Nesmuk spent two days trying to find his beloved canoe with no luck. He was told that it had been sent on to Cedar Keys, on Florida's west coast near his final destination. Refusing to depart with the ship, he finally agreed to rail passage in hopes of catching up to the bucktail. But as happens still today, lost items rarely turn up easily. Nesmuk went on by rail, but then learned that the canoe had not arrived at Cedar Key. Nesmuk sat down at one stop and refused to go any further. But then, the next day, his canoe somehow found him. Nesmuk wrote, Blessed sight, there lay the bucktail in her loveliness, as sound as the day she left Wellsboro. Making passage on the 11-ton schooner Sunrise, canoe and canoeist shortly found themselves in yet another storm, which Nesmuk described as, The worst qual I ever saw at sea, the worst racket I ever saw on salt water. Fortunately, the crew were expert at stripping sails until the sunrise was flying before the squall under bare poles. 
The next day found them at Anclody Keys, just offshore of Tarpon Springs, and the little sailing ship anchored up alongside thirty or more spongers lying two miles offshore. Instead of making for the wharf inshore, a small boat was dispatched to carry Nesmuk and four other passengers ashore. When the little boat grounded half a mile for shore and the other passengers waded their gear through the final stretch of the Gulf of Mexico, Nesmuk hopped into the little bucktail and put his double blade paddle to work up the Enclody River for the fledgling outpost of Tarpon Springs. For a journey that should have taken only five days, Nesmuk finally made his destination after two grueling weeks of travel. He said, I could have reached California in half the time, and all my clothes and camp duffel was left on board the sunrise with a solemn promise it should be landed the next day, which it wasn't. They are not particularly hurried in this region. His first day on the west coast was spent paddling up and down the winding Enclody River in search of human habitation. Not only did the river take the bucktail through all points of the compass, but its flow changed direction with the tides. These challenges came along with cold, one of the coldest Florida winters ever recorded. The Great Freeze, as it came to be called, led to the demise of multiple Florida towns, destroyed Florida's citrus crop, and pushed much further south the ranges of Florida native plants and animals. The winter of 1884 to 1885 was not what Nesmuk expected of the subtropics but he pushed on, eventually finding a lumber mill camp up the riverbank. Hiking through the darkening landscape, he found a small hotel and a warm fire. The next day, Nesmuk met Captain Kendall, the canoeist and boat builder, for the first time down at the river. Kendall, Tarpon, at six feet two inches tall, towered over Nesmuk's five foot three inches but the two shook hands with a hearty, double-handed grip. Before inviting Nesmuk up to the house, though, Kendall said, Hold on, I must have a ride in the bucktail first, if it's only to beat Mrs. K. Kendall settled his 170 pounds into the small craft and enjoyed his first excursion. But Mrs. Kendall soon made amends by paddling the bucktail to the springs and back. Nesmuk remarked, She trims my canoe better and sends it along faster than I do myself. The Kendalls carved out a tidy quarters for Nesmuk in the boat building shop with a bunk and writing desk that had been held for the preceding two months awaiting his arrival. Outside, the intrepid captain and boat builder had two new sharpies, one 24 feet and the other 33 feet in length, both ready for sea. Inside the shop, next to Nesmuk's bunk, were a workbench and two skiffs under construction. That night, Nesmuk imagined casting to the yard-long redfish he had seen while paddling across the shoals, but was too tired for anything but sleep. He wrote, It was a cold night in Florida, and I crept under all the blankets I could master, bade the captain a sleepy good night, and slept the sleep of the tired canoeist. Nesmuk spent the next week or so yearning for the wild, even wilder than the wilderness outpost that was the Kendall home and boat works. The captain and his wife, however, kept Nesmuk in their company and paddled with him upriver to the frontier village of Tarpon Springs, its population less than 100 at the time. The villagers were excited to meet the Kendall's famous visitor, and they marveled at the little bucktail. As Nesmuk put it, The bucktail was looked upon with much curiosity, as this was the first time two double bladers had ever made landfall there. Nesmuk and his host paddled up and down the Anclody River, exploring channels and bays, and portaging overland to Salt Lake and Lake Butler. They offered colorful flies from their split bamboo rods to the naive largemouth bass, and had a grand time pulling in single fish that easily fed three people. Eventually, Nesmuk got away on his own, though, 
making camp under the shade of majestic gnarled live oaks on a high spot of land between the Anclody River and Salt Lake. He built himself a five foot by seven foot shanty from pine boards and thatched the roof with palmetto leaves. This would be his home among the alligators, ibis, deer, grouse, bear, and redfish for weeks to come. One evening as his fire burned down, he pulled out a hard coal and scratched large letters onto a clear pine board. Oak Point, February 1885, Camp Tarpon, Nesmuk. From his fresh camp, Nesmuk had a harsh introduction to paradise, but one that still pleased him immensely. Normally sunny and rain-free, this February was anything but normal. Along with the brutal cold that winter came storms very unusual for the dry season. Nesmik wrote to his avid readers, Last evening there were thunderstorms all around me in all directions, but it was not until 10 p.m. that a heavy one struck the camp and it meant business. The furious wind drifted the rain in horizontal sheets. The lightning was fierce and incessant. The thunder, a heavy article of constant quantity and excellent quality. The entire affair, a display of grandeur and power, well worth turning out at midnight to see. The average outer would probably suggest that it could as well be seen in a dry skin from the windows of a comfortable hotel. And the average outer would be wrong. To thoroughly see and realize such a magnificent display, you would want to take it in as I did last night, where, by the vivid flashes, you can look far down the vistas of writhing pines and the long gray beards of century oaks. It was magnificent, but a little damp. Nesmuk lived a half-hunter, half-hermit life for 46 days in his shanty overlooking Salt Lake, then more at a second camp, signing off his letters to forest and stream from Camp Tarpon or from Oak and Pine. He paddled into Tarpon Springs periodically and picked up mail, which often included newspapers from home. But he did not read them, simply saving them all for the Kendalls to digest the news of the world as they saw fit. Nesmuk said that as time passed leisurely by, he lost all sense of the days of the week and the days of the month, and that even his watch caught the infection of laziness, first failing to keep accurate time, then finally declining to function altogether. But he was not worried with time. He hunted and fished as need be, often taking game only three or four days a week to sustain himself. He grew to admire and even love some of his former quarry. Of the two bevies of quail that visited his camp each day, Nesmuk said, At first I was a little disposed to utilize them as food, but on watching their cute, beautiful ways, my heart failed me. They were so graceful on the ground or on the wing that I decided to leave them in peace, believing that I could get more enjoyment from them alive than dead. And I did. And then there were the fearless crows that joined Camp Tarpon. At first he fed them, but then he changed his mind, referring to them as senseless, incorrigible thieves. They apparently stole just for fun, he said, taking dish rags, soaps, and teaspoons, until Nesmuk unloaded on them a shotgun shell that he had packed with gunpowder and sand. The crows did not return. Longing for new experiences in his southern paradise, in mid-March, Nesmuk carried down to Salt Lake, then crossed over into the uncharted Lake Butler, today known as Lake Tarpon. The next morning, Kendall joined him, and together they explored the larger lake, some two miles across and six and a half miles long, home to no humans. Nesmuk called it a crystal gem in an emerald setting of pine and palm. Filled with herons and flowing plumage, pink-hued spoonbills, 
cormorants and snake-necked anhingas. The lake was also a fishing paradise. During their day exploring the lake, Kendall collected birds for specimens, while Nesmuk caught fish for the night's supper. The next morning, with more fish and coffee to start the day, the two outdoor partners began exploring this new wilderness in detail. The pair set out through a swamp, but their goal of heading homeward that day was thwarted when Kendall's rag canoe snagged and began taking on water. They made for shore, built a fire, and commenced repairs with bits of canvas and wax, melted on a fire-heated axe head. Kendall opined, The beauty of a rag canoe is that she is so easily repaired. To which Nesmuk replied, The beauty of a clinker-built canoe is that she takes ten times the amount of snagging and don't need any mending at all. Kendall countered that the clinker-built canoe costs twice as much as his canvas canoe, to which Nesmuk ended that the lap-straight canoe lasts four times as long and will float a man when she is swamped. Good-natured debate between friends passed the time as the canoe's patch set up. Nesmuk said that he came to Florida to cruise in his canoe, not to fish and hunt, though he did these two as required to sustain himself. Already established as an ardent supporter of game laws and conservation, he was dismayed sometimes at the behavior of visitors to the hamlet of Tarpon Springs. One day a party of four hotel guests took 260 pounds of bass and sea trout. When he asked what they planned to do with so many fish, they answered that they would use as much as they could and give the rest to anyone who would take them away. One fisherman remarked, You see, there was a lady in the party who caught over 60 pounds. You wouldn't like to be beaten by a lady, would you? To which Nesmuk replied, Yes, I am willing to be beaten by anyone, man or woman, who shoots or fishes for slaughter. Near the end of his Florida camp stay, Nesmuk one morning heard a cart clattering up from the river towards the Kendall home. On the cart was a large box originating from Canton, New York, containing a fantastic surprise. By the time Nesmuk reached the home of his friends, the box was already open to reveal two delicate Rushton canoes. Mrs. Tarpon was, according to Nesmuk, actually dancing with delight like an excited schoolgirl. Her new lap straight canoe was slightly smaller than the bucktail, and inside this one was yet a smaller canoe, the new Rushton Fairbanks, eight and a half feet long and 23 inches beam. At only nine pounds, 15 ounces, Nesmick balanced her on the end of one finger. Mrs. Kendall paddled her little canoe up and down the river, and when she finally pulled out, she exclaimed, Oh, she is just lovely, worth half a dozen spring bonnets. Soon, Mrs. Kendall headed north to be with family for the summer, leaving her prized canoe hanging in the sitting room of their home. With the addition of this one and the Fairbanks, Nesmuk and Tarpon had a total of five canoes for their use including Nesmuk's bucktail and Kendall's two canvas canoes. In that same sitting room, Nesmuk and Tarpon planned to deck the light Rushton Fairbanks canoe with canvas, load it and the bucktail onto Kendall's newly built Sharpie, and set sail for new waters and newer adventures in the even wilder Thousand Islands of extreme southwest Florida. Nesmuk's health continued to decline over the next few years, and he died May 1st of 1890. In a short note dated August 23, 1890, his nostalgic friend Kendall wrote to Forest and Stream. Sixteen years ago, a dray man drove up to Tarpon Ranch with two canoes and one box, the Smarty weighing 16 pounds and the Rushton weighing in at 9 pounds 15 ounces. The Rushton was carried by Nesmuk. The other canoe has been paddled by Mrs. Tarpon. The Rushton got back to Tarpon Ranch again and is snuggled up alongside the Smarty, as ready for the water as the day they were taken out of the box 16 years ago. 
Poor old Nesmuk. The sight of the little ten-pounder calls back the many pleasant cruises we have had together. May he have a better canoe in the happy hunting ground. Before the end of the same year, Captain Samuel D. Kendall also would be gone. Despite his poor health, Nesmuk made it to just shy of 70 years, Kendall to 61. Both adventurers survived well past the average life expectancy of the time, which was only in the mid-40s. Perhaps because of the clean woods life they espoused, and perhaps because they both chose to live their convictions. Nesmuk once described drifting off to dreamland and his wild Florida camp with Kendall at his side. Having swapped yarns until a late hour, we drew our blankets around us, and there came the old familiar voices of the night. Voices familiar, yet unknown. Voices that I knew 50 years ago, but the owners of which have always been, to me, a mystery. Today, the voice of Nesmuk still resonates through the years. His deep and abiding love of the outdoors, always fresh and clear, and at least some of those little Russian canoes still dance on waters today.